travel infections. You know, when we think about travel, what do we think of? We think of Switzerland, and we think of uh, going to the Mediterranean and the French Riviera, and that's what we think about travel. But we don't uh, realize that when we are going for travel, in fact, these are all photographs that I've taken on my travel, so you all can enjoy the photographs. But uh, when we talk about travel, we don't realize uh, what kind of infections that we are going to land up with. We always, even if you search the literature or you search the net, you'll always find travel infections about people who come from Southeast Asia back to Europe or back to America. So they talk about malaria, they talk about typhoid, they talk about tuberculosis. But we don't really have any data about travel infections when we come back from a vacation and what we are going to land up with. So if we talk about international travel by Indians, I'm going to divide this into international travel and domestic travel. So if we talk about international travel by Indians abroad, 16 million traveled in the year 2012. And by 2013, the aviation industry is expected to grow by another 10%. So another 10% is going to travel. Now, how do these travel infections really do they matter? Let's talk about swine flu. We had the influenza talk in the morning. And we know that the swine flu epidemic started in Mexico in the uh, March 2009. And by mid-May, it had spread to the rest of the world. And how did it spread? It spread through travel infection. So it spread to people who are infected traveling to other countries, and that's how it, the epidemic came across. The thing is, uh, influenza is one of the commonest travel infections that we are going to land up with. Most of us are just going to land up with a URTI, and that's about it. We are not really going to think even about asking any patient who comes with a URTI, did you travel abroad, Until unless it's become a real epidemic, and it's all there in the papers, and then you're panicking, and you're giving oseltamivir to every patient who gets a URTI, and you're giving oseltamivir to every patient who gets three episodes of URTI. So we, we may land up treating, uh, also giving oseltamivir to every URTI nowadays. So that is one aspect of travel infection or the epidemic that really panicked us. Now, this is the kind of uh, infection. It started, you can see the epidemic hub, which started in Mexico. and. Uh, this is where Mexico is. And then by May 2009, it had spread to the rest of the world. Now, which are the top travel destinations for Indians? I don't want to sound like a travel agency, but these are the top uh, destinations for India. We like to go to Southeast Asia. We like to go to Europe, and we like to go to US. We don't like to go to Africa. So eosinophilia is not a part of my talk, because uh, Dr. Achena Swami has already covered it. She told me that, are you going to speak a lot on travel eosinophilia? I said, no, 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 that's not a part of my talk at all. So we like to go to these places. We, nowadays, we're picking up South America as a destination for travel. So, But th those are the areas. Now let's talk about Southeast Asia. Where do we go in Southeast Asia? We go to Bangkok, we go to Thailand, we go to Singapore, we go to the beaches. Okay, th This is where we end up going in uh, Southeast Asia. And what are the infections there that are common there? The infections that are there are the same that's there in India. We have enteric fever, dengue, malaria, hand, foot, mouth, chikungunya. The only difference was the Nipah virus encephalitis that was seen in Malaysia some years back. So if we get a child with enteric dengue, we are not going to really ask them about travel infections. But a European coming to India and then getting diarrhea or getting uh, fever after going back, they definitely look for all these conditions. So this is something I'm not going to take in the part of a travel infection because this is endemic to our country. Only thing is, remember, chikungunya is not only in part of Southeast Asia. It also covers a lot of uh, Africa belt. So if you've got somebody coming with fever and joint pains, think of chikungunya if he's traveled to Africa. Uh, Nipah virus encephalitis was seen in the 1990s in Malaysia, and uh, they finally found it that it was related to pigs and mosquito bites, and they destroyed 1.1 million pigs. So if you get a child who's come to you with viral encephalitis, always keep in mind that you must ask for a travel history. Now, uh, can you see the turtles in this? So this was a turtle farm, and you can see nicely when we go on holidays, we like to touch animals. So a lot of travel infections are also zoonoses that we come across. So let's go across a case. This is an 18-year-old boy. Uh, he came with fever and chills for three days, had diarrhea one week prior to the fever, no response to antimalarials. You do a hemogram, you do a PS4 MP, urine, chest x-ray, everything's normal. But the fever with chills is not going, so a PI, I mean, uh, consult is taken for a pediatric infectious disease. 
and this uh, can you think of anything we are on a talk of travel infection so obviously you're going to ask for travel history in this particular patient now you can see that this patient had also visited the elephant farm and had gone into the brackish waters brackish waters now if we go into the travel history so when i took the history in this particular patient there was a history of travel to sri lanka 20 days ago the patient had eaten street food so you always think of typhoid he had gone bungee jumping done snorkeling traveled to wooded areas visited brackish waters in a boat but no swimming in that visited an elephant farm fed the baby elephants visited a turtle farm touched the turtles so you can see i showed you all the pictures of all that so can we think of any etiology with this child could have landed up with okay so we know that this particular patient touched turtles now turtles tend to harbor non typhoidal salmonella we in fact had a topic of non typhoidal salmonella in our last pidc where dr ami had spoken on it so a turtle farm harbor for non typhoidal salmonella brackish waters vibrio so we've got little street food so obviously typhoid so we think of typhoid non typhoidal salmonella in this child a blood culture was done and it showed non typhoidal salmonella and he was treated with oral ciprofloxacin and there was a history of diarrhea one week prior to the fever so everything fit into that non typhoidal salmonella so travel history becomes very very important even when you are traveling across nowadays whenever i go to any destination and i look at an animal i go to a chinese restaurant and i said to oh salmonella and i go to our <laughs> zoo and i say oh this one that thing okay so now we come to europe and we think europe is so hygienic so nice no infections we drink tap water there we indians are very stingy right we don't want mineral water in europe it costs 1 pound 1 euro why do we waste that money we drink tap water we've got good immune systems so infections on tour, uh, tour of europe we got tick bone we go get lyme's disease we get relapsing fever we get spotted fevers we get q fevers tick bone encephalitis and tularemia we say we don't get all this because we don't go to the woods indians don't like to go to hiking and trekking we are sedentary people so we don't like to do all that so we are not going to land up with these kind of infections this is a 10 year old girl she came with fever for two two weeks on examination she had a murmur and she had a hepatomegaly and echo was done it showed vegetation of the mitral valve so there, this was infective endocarditis her blood culture though was negative she was treated with ceftriax and floxacillin for 10 days repeat blood culture no growth fever continues to persist so if you see her biochemical parameter she has slight elevated of uh, liver enzymes and she has elevated white cell count so again a pid consult was taken why is this fever not going down you have a culture negative infective endocarditis so on history we found out that she used to stay in a village and they had a cattle farm there 6 uh, months ago so when you think of cattle farm you think of infective endocarditis and you think of hepatitis the first thing that comes to your mind is q fever so uh, this child we started her on doxycycline her coxiella burnetti igg was positive so this this was q fever and then we added chloroquine so when we talk about this is a rare condition it's not very common but i'm just giving you an idea as to an analysis to a case a thinking process that nowadays whenever you see a patient with fever don't forget to ask history of travel don't forget of uh, asking history of contact with animals so this child uh, coxiellati burnetti uh, is uh, basically from cattle especially pregnant cattle and it's more common in adults acute illness will be self limited illness you won't get anything but it's the chronic illness that causes hepatitis osteomyelitis infective endocarditis especially culture negative endocarditis uh, and you diagnose it by elisa you have got phase 1 antibody and you have got phase 2 antibodies basically you need to know these antibodies because you need to de decide the duration of treatment based on the antibody titers now let's come to america when we go to america we go to statue of liberty we go to san francisco we like to go to california we like to go to niagara falls uh, this is a picture of san francisco that i have shown you and we like to go and see the uh, forest areas so infections from america that you could land up with is basically limes and histoplasmosis now if you see the area for histoplasmosis it's the mississippi belt the ohio region from the great lakes so that's the area if so if you've traveled in this particular area you could land up with histoplasmosis Histoplasmosis presentation is just like tuberculosis. They land up with primary complex, they land up with primary progressive lesions, 
and most of them will resolve on their own. Few of them persist. So if you have a TB-like picture in a child who's gone to the US in this particular area of US, think of histoplasmosis. The Lyme's disease. Lyme's disease is basically in the temperate area. You get it in the California region. You get it in the Western Europe region, in the woods, and you get it in the Eastern Europe wooded areas. Now, again, I'll tell you, this girl was Dr. Aspirani's patient and uh, admitted in Nanavati. She was a six-month-old girl. She had this rash all over the body, and she had six, uh, fever six days prior to the rash. This rash was non-itchy, suspected to be eczema, but it was a non-itchy rash, and there was no response to antihistaminics, so they called me in to have a look at this child. And when we, I've just, I've not got the picture of the child because by the time we decided to take the picture, the rash had disappeared. So this is the kind of rash that this child had, six month old, disseminated this kind of a annular rash that she had. When I took the history, I found out she was a resident of San Francisco, six month old child. Though she did not have outdoor activities, they used to stay next to the woods. And they had just arrived in Mumbai a week ago. So what's the likely diagnosis that you're going to consider? You're going to consider Lyme's because this is erythema migrans. So we treated her with cefuroxime and the rash disappeared. Now Lyme's disease is basically caused by Borrelia. It comes from bites of infected ticks. And they usually have onset in summer when people are going into the woods for trekking and hiking. Uh, the earliest skin lesion that you would see is these erythema migrans. Usually it's isolated. You don't get disseminated. Sometimes it may spread all over and you would get disseminated erythema migrans. If you miss it out, then these patients can go on to develop facial palsy. They can get arthritis after the onset. And the treatment is pretty simple. You just need to give doxycycline in children more than eight years. The alternative is amoxicillin or cefuroxime. And for meningitis, carditis, arthritis, you need to give ceftriaxone for 14 to 28 days. In fact, when I talk about travel infection, we talk about Lyme's. When people from Europe talk about Lyme's, they talk about it as an endemic disease for them. We like to go on cruise. We like to go to Venice. We like to go on a Mediterranean cruise. And we don't think about what kind of infections we land up with these kind of. So if you're on a cruise, the most common thing that you're going to land up with is gastroenteritis, and especially in the European waters, the norovirus. We would land up with influenza, but influenza is quite rampant even with uh, airline travel. Leogenella. Don't forget any child who comes with a URTI could be harboring Leogenella from a cruise. And Leogenella can be of two types. Either it could be an acute bacterial pneumonia or it could be like a Pontac fever, like an influenza-like fever, which would have a spontaneous recovery in two to five days. Now we talk about uh, immunization. We talk about chloroquine prophylaxis when people are coming from abroad to India and we say you need to be on chloroquine prophylaxis because you're going to land up with malaria. Is there something that we need to do when we go abroad? Are there some vaccines that we need to take? So some children we need to take their vaccines in an accelerated manner if they're going to stay for a little long time. There is a travel guideline on CDC. If you're traveling to India, please take typhoid vaccine, hepatitis A vaccine, please take malaria prophylaxis, take DET spray with you and travel. And drink only boiled water or bottled water. So that's the guideline that they give to people who are traveling to our country. So if we have to take the vaccines, I mean, most of the vaccines, we would be following the same schedule that we are following, except that hepatitis A and B, we could give, if suppose we are going to go to Bangkok or go to Sri Lanka, we could give them in an accelerated manner. So we could give them the vaccine, the second dose within a week. If we are giving a combination vaccine of hep A and B, so we give a second dose within a week and a third dose after two weeks after the second dose. So you give it very accelerated. So not like zero, one, six months. You're giving it zero, one week and three weeks. Similarly for hepatitis B, if you need to give it in an accelerated manner, you could give it at birth, the second dose after four weeks and the third dose after 16 weeks of the first dose. Other vaccines, if you need to keep, keep a gap of four weeks between any of the vaccines. And hepatitis A, if you're giving isolated, then you need to give it after six months. So if you're giving combination, you need to give an accelerated schedule. Otherwise, you give it. Now, we talked about yellow fever. And we said, if you're going to go to Africa, you'll need the yellow fever vaccine. Now, when would you need a yellow fever vaccine? There was some time back a news in the paper that some actor came back from South Africa and had not taken yellow fever vaccine, so he was quarantined for 10 days. So whenever you travel to South America and Africa, you need to take the yellow fever vaccine, otherwise you'll be quarantined when you come back. 
So this vaccine is recommended for all children nine years of age and above. Make sure you don't have egg protein allergy because if you have that, you can't take the vaccine. You will ask me next question, where do we get this vaccine? So when you're traveling to Africa and South America, yellow fever vaccine, anyone going for Hajj to South, uh, Saudi Arabia needs to take the meningococcal vaccine during the Hajj season. So these are the two vaccines we need to take when we are traveling to these countries. So this is the yellow fever belt, Africa and South America. So nowadays you have a lot of, uh, in fact, I read it in the IMA bulletin about a South American uh, tour for doctors in the IMA. So this is one vaccine that you all will have to take. The yellow fever vaccine center is there in Mumbai. It's next to the airport. If you even type Google it out, you will get the address and you can go there and take the vaccine. Now let's talk about domestic travel. So domestic travel, we usually, you ask patients, they always say Diwali time, summer time, they like to go back to their villages. So there is going to be, you always worry about Brusilla because if they go to village, they are going to be in contact with their cattle and goats. So you worry about Brusilla and obviously you worry about non-typhoidal salmonella. This was a case I saw last week. This is uh, Dr. Kamlesh Haria's patient. And uh, this was a 12 year old boy he had fever for three days. He had hemoconcentration thrombocytopenia. Dengue NS1 was positive, IgG positive. He was treated with IV fluid, ceftriaxone. So he was classical dengue. But the fever continued to persist. So on day seven, he had a fever of 106, and that's when I got a call. And uh, on the phone, they told me that the CRP had increased from negative to 48. Blood culture, Vidal, optimal malaria, leptospira, everything was negative. So you had a child with dengue who continued to run fever and now fever of 106 and a positive CRP. So I told them on phone that you change the anti because dengue can have a lot of gram negative septicemia because they have a leaky GI tract. So a lot of gram negative bacteria can go up into the system. And quite a few of us actually are harboring community acquired ESPLs. So I said just change the antibiotic to piprasilin, tazobactam, let's wait for 48 hours and then take a call and I told them to repeat a blood culture. So the antibiotic was changed to piprasil and tazobactam. Repeat, uh, CBC showed leukocytosis now. Platelets had come up, but the fever after 48 hours was still persisting. So that's when I went and saw the patient. When I saw the patient, he had fever, he had a strawberry tongue, and I didn't find anything on examination. So I go went into the history. And on the history, we found out that the, they had got rabbits at home a month back. So now they had a pet rabbit. I mean, nowadays I find that I used to think that Americans <laughs> or uh, Australians had crazy pets. They used to keep lizards and snakes as their pets. But when I see Indians keeping pets, I realize we are even crazier. We can keep anything as pets. So these people had got rabbits at home and they had kept it as a pet. So can you think of something now that this child could have got from the rabbit which could have caused this infection? Why am I discussing now here this particular patient? It's not a travel infection, but why am I discussing here is because it's related to travel. We've always heard about rabbits causing tularemia. We've never had tularemia in India proven, okay? And we don't have tests to prove it. So just as there was a question, is cystic fibrosis there in India? Because we didn't have the test, we used to say it's not there. But similarly, for tularemia, we think it's not there. So anyway, this child, we suspected tularemia. I told them to give streptomycin. They were reluctant to give IM injection. So finally, we settled on to doxycycline. And within next 24 hours, the fever went away. Okay, now tularemia, we said travel infection to Europe. But you could get similar thing if you have an animal exposure here in India. So fever in travel individuals could be common right from influenza to dengue. Exotic infections are becoming more and more common because we are now prone to go, go, doing adventure sports during travel. And in PUOs, don't forget travel history as well as animal exposure history. Uh, there was this another child in Nanavati. This is Dr. Avinash Walavalkar's patient. This child was admitted with fever, had meningeal signs, did an LP, had aseptic meningitis like picture. They started the child on ceftriaxone on acyclovir. Fever continued to persist even after seven days. They did an extended Vidal, which showed rickettsial, wheel felix, all three titers positive. So you had an OX2, OXK, and OX19, all three positive, and then they asked me to see this child. Uh, this child, now when you have all three, you know it's false, uh, false positive, it's not possible that it's rickettsial. But when we looked at the titers, we actually found OX2, OXK, one is to 300, 320. So that's a significant titer. Then we went into the history. 
There was a history of travel to Titwala, where he went into the woods. Okay, so you could get rickets here from the woods. You could have scrub typhus without a rash. We started doxy. In 48 hours, the fever did come down. But again, the fever is still there, but it's not completely gone. So always remember, no matter what kind of a child you're seeing, travel history becomes very important, whether it's international travel or domestic travel. Thank you very much.